Okay, starting in three, two, one. First thing I'm going to do is provide some characterization, uh, then discuss how these indictments and investigations have actually helped and emboldened Trump, causing widespread distrust of the institutions of American government and democracy. And I'm going to provide the counterfactual um, and why we regret what has occurred and why, like, if this hadn't happened, we would have been in a better place. And we think that that's well, more desirable than preferable. So firstly, characterization. So um, there's a fair bit here, but Trump won the 2016 election playing on anti-establishment views of American Americans um, and like a system that like many Americans sort of distrust. And, and many people voted for him for this reason and it's sort of played out in the January 6th riots. A lot of opinion polls have shown this continual distrust of the establishment, of establishment politics, of establishment, establishment people. Uh, Trump, the way he spoke, the way he came to politics was very different to those who had come before him. And so he played off this to sort of um, screw distrust. People in America are obviously quite disengaged. We have a non-compulsory voting system and not a strong democratic connection or culture to uh, local candidates. Uh, this allowed Trump to play on this, uh, to sort of come in as this like national figure to try and make America great again, to bring it back, uh, attacking these institutions. Um, and a lot of the criticisms of Biden are similar to the criticisms of those before him. Trump has re-emerged. He is the uh, Republican candidate. Polls look like he may win the election. Um, and a huge amount of people uh, like believe in his, his sort of um, statements um, and people are distrusting these institutions. So first of all, these indictments and investigations that have occurred over the past few years have helped and emboldened Trump to gain more political power, to gain more votes, and to get back on the scene to actually looking like he may become uh, the president again. Um, the indictments have largely been ineffective and have the opposite effect of in being intended, right? A lot of these indictments that have been pursued by the Department of Justice in the US have been like less criminality like, based things, right? Things like not correcting, not storing documents correctly or like not putting tax returns in the right way. They've been like relatively sort of white collar or sort of not seen as like seriously criminal things. Um, so like on one hand, they're not viewed by a lot of people as being like seriously of issue. Um, but what actually has happened is, well, nothing has happened. Like, nothing has come about due to these indictments and investigations. We had discussions that he would be impeached, but he wasn't, and he remained as the president. We had discussions that he might be jailed, he might face, like, large penalties, but really, he hasn't, like, had any significant impact upon him, right? It's like, he's still got his large assets, he really hasn't been financially hit that much, he hasn't had to go to prison, he wasn't impeached, and now he's literally the Republican candidate to become president. And like I said, polls looking like he may well win, right? So what's happened is that these indictments and these investigations haven't actually tangibly led to anything that has disrupted Trump or like um, mitigated his ability to perform as a, like what we characterize as like a bad actor. And like I'm gonna get to later. We think Trump getting elected again is bad. We don't think that like what Trump is saying and the policies are gonna be good for America or the world. Um, but like, Really what happened from these like, tax documents and the, the, the documents of Mar-a-Lago is the conservative media like, played off this and compared it to the fact that people like Hillary and Obama weren't prosecuted, people like Hunter Biden weren't facing similar scrutiny. So what people were able to do is like, characterize and craft a narrative that Trump was being targeted by this sort of left-wing justice system led by Biden that sort of, you know, the establishment was against him and out to get him. And that the people that had voted for Trump were being betrayed by the, the institutions that they should feel supported by, by going after someone who, um, like, many people support. So what Trump has done is weaponize this for his own political gain. Um, his campaign is often focused about sort of responding to this, like, legal um, sort of attack on him by the, by the, the um, like, Biden's uh, government and the legal system in the US. Um, Following the election, like Trump was banned from Twitter, he relatively disappeared from the public eye for a while. A lot of people were talking about that he would never re-emerge again. But what happened when all these prosecutions and indictments were talked about is people like on the left, particularly in America, got excited that potentially Trump might face some charges, might face some punishments. Obviously, nothing really eventuated from it. But what it did provide is massive, F, um, like massive media coverage, which came at zero effort to Trump. He was banned from uh, Twitter, uh, like sort of pushed backwards. Uh, the Republican movement seemed to sort of condemn him. We had a lot of like, pro like, like not progressive, but like actually conservative Republicans coming out and saying, look, his behavior on January 6th and as president was really disgraceful. We don't support that. We're gonna create a movement to bring the Republican party back to something that believes in democratic institutions and like um, democratic government. 
And so he wasn't really receiving public discussion or attention during his time. He was relatively isolated from public view. He starts up his own like weird, nutty, like true social rubbish. Like he's, he's doing all this stuff in the background. This media coverage like, massively brings these issues to the front. It's like, wow, the former president might be convicted. Hey, you know, no, oh, not many former presidents. Like he's, he's gonna, you know, this and that, and oh, and he might face this. And none of it actually, but like, really eventually, like, some things were proved. Like he's like convicted of some things, but they were quite minor. And so it enabled people like him and the media and the conservative media to sort of uh, go after these institutions and to, to play on this. Um, and what, what we argue is that it's gonna allow him to downplay future potentially more serious prosecutions. Like if he actually does engage in like more serious uh, issues of uh, breaching like the democratic system or doing things in parliament that like complete, like just doing what, like committing worse criminal offences, uh, or, you know, going against the systems um, of government and the, the law that he has to follow if he does get elected, um, because the, he's created so much distrust. So second substantive, ultimately, this has enabled Donald Trump to like proliferate a distrust of the US political system. He's kind of capitalized on these issues, on these investigations and indictments, and he's argued that the system is corrupt and flawed. It's led to many American people, like genuinely, feeling isolated and at odds with the American institutions of democracy that are supposed to stand for things like justice. And so what people have associated these convictions with is like people like Biden and the left or the non-Trump Republicans going after him, like they don't want him to win. Um, so he's enabled, he basically said like, they're going after me, they didn't go after Hillary, they didn't go after Obama, but they're after me. Um, and as a fact, they don't care about you, the people that are voting for Trump. Um, he's enabled to like argue that the system is corrupt against him. So ultimately, like this causes people to get angry at the fact that Trump's being prosecuted because the, the media that they're receiving, like things like Fox News, the, the way in which they're seeing him displayed on left-wing media as someone who's been going after. But, like people are, are questioning, well, hang on a second, he hasn't actually done anything wrong. If the only convictions they found him on was like some tax fraud, people just probably don't care about that. But the more worrying thing is it causes people like to question and trust, like not trust the legal system and the like, important institutions of American democracy, like which we tell you is very important because that reduces accountability and transparency in the future because it, it, it likely allows like people to, you know, circumvent things because really the outcome of a, of a criminal court or of a like civil dispute might simply not matter to a lot of the American people. The counterfactual is that if this never happened, the media landscape does not talk about Trump as much in the gap between the 2020 and 2024 election. It doesn't dominate the cycle as much. Trump isn't given the ammunition that people are still going after him, and he remains sort of sided back. He still makes a move for presidency, but this sort of movement has not um, abridged. Uh, and these prosecutions um, just, just lead, led Trump to getting media attention. They don't happen. Uh, we think it's bad if Trump gets elected. Human rights, international relations issues, impacts on people of minority, like, it's severe. We think both sides probably agree with this. But these indictments haven't actually done anything to hinder Trump at all. They've just emboldened his race to become the next president. Thank you. has come out today and focused on the craziest of Trump's groupies. You know, the ones who were at the insurrection, the ones who would probably vote for him even if he shot someone on live television, right? We don't think these people are what this debate is truly about. These people would follow Trump like to the ends of the earth. They 
would believe whatever you said. You know, we think this debate is about the average reasonable person and what they believe about Trump and what the insurrection says to them. So firstly, uh, in straight speech, I will deal with the counterfactual given by the opposition and our two pieces of standard. Firstly, the effect of Trump and secondly, how what this is about political accountability. Um, just dealing with the counterfactual, we think uh, a couple of things about the average reasonable person that this debate is really targeted at, right? We think the average person knows Trump is a bad person, right? We think that the indictments are not just, you know, the, the um, classified files that the firm is focused on, but it includes um, the false claims of winning the election, it includes the insurrection charges. We think those are the far more serious things that the firm has cherry picked and decided to ignore. Um, we think the Average reasonable person, you know, knows a few things. Knows one, Trump led the insurrection, right? Supported it, said things on Twitter, did things like that. We think um, they know that Trump refused to accept the 2020 election results. Um, they know that um, Trump violated trust through those uh, maintaining those classified documents, and we don't think that's really that small of a white collar thing because these are classified documents that he received as a president. That's not a typical white collar crime. Like you have to be the president to do this. Right? We think the average voter knows that Trump is like just a horrible person in general. He's just incredibly sexist, incredibly transphobic. So we think the overall general perception of Trump is someone who's very erratic, whose policy has been very conservative and very polarizing within America, right? Um, we don't think that these are people who are so easily going to be swayed by these anti-establishment views because we think that's a very narrow group of people who will not change their mind no matter what, regardless of um, this debate. Um, now just moving on to my substantive. First of all, what is the effect of, on Trump um, of these indictments? So given that we think, you know, the average reasonable person thinks that Trump is considered so erratic, so divisive, so discriminatory, we think that if we prove that the indictments have hindered his political career in some way, we win this debate, right? A um, few reasons um, why this has hindered, hindered Trump's career. Firstly, it's the election cycle. It's great timing, right? The timing's ideal. It's been through the media cycle in the last year. Um, people have a recency bias, right? Because it's so recent, it's so fresh on their minds, for this year's election, they're very aware of it. It's likely to have the most significant impact on the actual election. Um, secondly, he's an ex-president. It, he's just like a very controversial figure. He was in a position of massive power. It's just juicy news. It had significant media attention. I don't think either side is um, denying that. And we think the media is very likely to inflate these charges to really, you know, go on about um, how his criminal charges and so on because it's such um, big news. Um, thirdly, we think that they, most people also look at the courts to provide some sort of justice and some sort of indication on like the morality of a person, right? And we think that being investigated or like, indicted is a terrible look for Trump um, ahead of this election cycle. We think that people perceive that if you're being investigated for a crime, you've done something wrong, right? Um, so what's the impact of this? Firstly, we think that this prevents Trump from really bolstering public interest and really garnering support for his um, campaign. Secondly, we think that, again, Trump just seems more and more divisive, more and more like just a horrible person, like a criminal, um, and obviously that's going to hinder his election chances. Thirdly, as I mentioned before, we think that the most hardcore Trump supporters will still back Trump. That's not what today's debate is about, right? We're saying that, um, we're not saying like Trump isn't, like Trump clearly is still the primary candidate for the Republicans. We're not saying that changes. We're saying we're affecting the swing voters, um, the Republican, or the, the Republican moderates and the swing voters. Voters. So we think that we see things like the um, more moderate Republicans shifting to people like Nikki Haley, who um, I'd like to know won a state primary, who's the first Republican woman to do so, to win a state primary, and has received significant donations from within the Republican Party. We think that this signifies a huge chunk of the Republican Party is breaking off from Trump and moving to a more moderate candidate. And we think a large part of that is because he's on the news for being a criminal. Um, uh, we think also, you know, obviously swing voters, this news could swing voters from um, swing Republican votes to Democratic ones. And we think that these swing votes or these moderate Republicans changing their minds is the, the 
these are the people we're really focusing on, right? Not like the crazy Trump groupies who listen to whatever he says. Um, we think that it's especially important in this election because so many issues like women's rights, abortion rights, things like that are so prevalent. And we think that also it just looks especially horrible for Trump if he loses this election right off the 2020 election that he's still denying, right? We think it just looks politically horrible for him. Um, now moving on to my second piece of substantive, which is about political accountability. And basically just political accountability is important. Indicting Trump gets us to there because that means he's not you know, above the law. Um, why is this true? We think this is just empirically true that you know Trump was involved in some way. Like some of these things just happen. It's true that the riots happened. It's true that you know there are files in his home that should not be there. Um, it's just empirically true that these things happen. And obviously, it's up to a court to determine if Trump is responsible, right? We think this is just how the law works. You go to follow the law. Trump shouldn't be above the law. Um, which basically what we get from this is if a president is charged um, under this, we think that we achieve a couple of things, right? Firstly, we set a precedent that even the highest office can be held to account when they break the law, right? No one is above the law. Um, and we think that's incredibly important for like faith in the justice system to know that no one is above the justice system. Um, secondly, we think this also demonstrates the separation of powers, right? It reestablishes the importance of the separation of powers and how you know the justice and the legislative branches need to hold, or executive branches need to hold themselves accountable, um, and shows to the public that there is some form of accountability being um, implemented in these systems. Um, so. Essentially, what we achieve by the end of this point is we just get more politicians aware that they can't just commit crimes. Like we have this president of the highest office in America being indicted, right? So they're more aware they can't just get away with things because they will be held to account. Um, we think, you know, examples like George Santos who uh, misused campaign funds and things like that. Like we think we'd see far less of that in our world where it's clear that politicians, including the president, are held to the same standards as everyone else. Secondly, we just think we get more political and um, we get more buy-in both in the political and judicial system because um, you can clearly see it working. You can see people being held to account. We think that this is particularly important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, as I said, incredibly important election. And secondly, Voting isn't compulsory in America, right? So we think that this can also draw a n increase voter attendance um, and conversely affect uh, Trump's election chances that way. And for these reasons, I'm proud to negate. really telling when First Negative gets up and it's like, you know, the average reasonable person knows that Donald Trump is bad. Okay, how did he win the 2016 election then? How was it that in 2020 he was defeated not by a landslide, but it was close enough to assume that the average reasonable person in America generally believes a lot of the things that he says, or generally believes in a lot of the policies that he says. Either side negative is correct, and the only average reasonable people in America are Democrats, or we are correct, and that the only average, like the average reasonable person, 
probably doesn't actually buy into the American political system as much as they want them to, which is something that we told you at first affirmative, which goes unresponded to. Um, so, a couple of other things in terms of like rebuttal, and then I'll just I kind of whip what we get from Will. Um, firstly, is that first negative also says that we won't change that he's the candidate, and that's something that neither side is able to change. That's the problem. If these criminal charges were successful, he wouldn't be able to run again. He wouldn't be the candidate again, because then it does show the politicians are not above the law. The fact that he has been charged, the fact that he is running again, the fact that most of the opposition to him in the Republican Party have dropped out of the race, means then that he probably is actually above the law. And that's easy for us to say as well, but I think the perception that the average reasonable person in America has is that they see this as a failing institution, which then plays into the rhetoric that he put it forward, not only in 2016, not only in 2020, but again now, which is looking increasingly likely that he is going to have at least some level of success in um, the presidential election this year. That's quite concerning to us. Even if he doesn't win, the amount of people that are going to vote for him based on that perception means that there is a deep distrust in political systems, or just like governmental systems more broadly, um, and this is something that he's able to capitalize on and increase um, through this. So the last thing in terms of like kind of more generic stuff is about precedence. Um, oh yeah, actually, that's just, I, like I just had that. But the last thing to say about it is that they're like, yes, it's good to show that people aren't above the law. Like again, that is quite idealistic. That is good if those charges were successful. The fact that they have not been successful means that those impacts are far worse because it shows that even the most powerful people in the country cannot be brought down by an institution that should be separate from uh, the government, that should be able to prosecute and do its due job. Um, the fact that it's failed means that the way that people perceive these things is problematic. So um, let's just kind of... Um, briefly on context, and I would note again that these are things which are totally, like almost entirely unresponded to by First Mayor, um, is that that political engagement is part of the reason that he won in 2016, because he was able to play on the fact that he is different to Hillary Trump, uh, Hillary Trump, Hillary Clinton, <laughs> that, like, that Hillary represents the old guard, represents the things that people have been switching away from. I am new, I am different, and this is independent of his policies. Right, because like we also agree that a 2024 Trump presidency is bad. We just think that this is literally giving him the tools to win that presidency without him actually having to lift a finger. So there's already a revealed preference for people, well, not preference, but like there's already kind of uh, showing that people disengage with systems. The fact that people literally stormed the White House, which is the beacon of the American government and American democracy, means that they probably actually don't give a shit about American democracy. Um, do we think that that's likely to happen again? Not necessarily, but the fact that people did it means that they deeply hold those beliefs and that those beliefs are so, so important to them that they are willing to act in some capacity um, that shows that they are deep, like deeply against that. Again, that is quite concerning. So, what is our counterfactual then? We think in the counterfactual, where this does not happen, that is a far more preferable world because maybe it means that a different Republican you know, like wins the election. Maybe it doesn't necessarily mean that Joe Biden wins again, but we think that is a better option to Trump coming back because of what Trump represents and because of the way that people idolize Donald Trump outside of just being a politician. Like to a lot of those people, he is a celebrity first and a politician second. Um, that is deeply concerning. So how has this then made that worse or like kind of how does this feed into those narratives? Um, the first thing to say is that this gives him greater political power because these investigations have had the opposite effect. Again, something we tell you at first. Um, because he's able to go out to the media, like in the small instances that, he's, that he does, and be like, they're out to get me, you know, don't trust these things, like, um, you know, the government like hates me, blah, 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 blah. Um, which has two impacts of that being weaponized. Number one, people just distrust the government more. And again, we tell you that there's structural reasons to why this is true. The fact that there is not a 100% engagement in like the electoral process, the fact that people don't have like very close relations with like their Congress people in the same way that you do in other countries, like it's very uh, not very proximate to them. Um, so it means firstly that people just distrust that system more. Seems bad, particularly noting that like electoral cycles are the main kind of uh, mechanism for accountability that governments have. Obviously, if you are able to commit a crime and then get elected, then what kind of accountability do you have if that if you can get voted again? And for the people that care about those things, like as in like you know, 
very progressive, like left-leaning people, if you see that someone commits a crime and then gets elected to the presidency, does, that, that doesn't incentivize you to actually act against that person. It looks like it's hopeless, like I'll mechanize that in a little bit, like don't worry, like trust. But secondly, uh, people support him more, again, bad, because that is the reason that he gets elected, um, like, you know, re-elected. So, why then does this make the anti-Trump campaign, or at least like, you know, progressivism, generally harder? Um, because cults of personality already in themselves are dangerous, because you idolize them beyond the point of like, you know, them being a normal person who can commit crimes or like, you know, be held accountable. But it's much easier to energize your base of support, like, like for Donald Trump to energize his base of support, than it is actual activists. Because as an activist, you need to incentivize people outside of your kind of like, um, base about things that maybe aren't so proximate to them. That's incredibly difficult. That's why social movements are not always successful in the way that we want them to be. Compare that to Donald Trump being like, no, this government sucks, it is out to get me. People believe that. It is much easier for people to make that logical gap and make those leaps to believe what Donald Trump says than it is for people who are like generally feeling pretty hopeless about it um, to convince those swing voters to vote for Democrats. Um, and again, like just empirically, like people are voting for Democrats less um, and are voting for Republicans more. Um, I think, you know, like I, I, I think we can like find that. Um, so the problem then, um, yeah. So the last thing to say is that we think that Trump twenty twenty four is bad. That's not uncontroversial. But um, what is controversial is that it now means you need a massive amount of political capital to overturn that narrative that the media cycle is perpetrating. Not even Donald Trump is doing it, but the media cycle is. It means that you have to have an enormous amount of ability to overturn the narratives that the media is uh, like propagating, to overturn the millions and millions of comments of people being like, you know, express, uh, explicitly showing their support of Donald Trump in like comment sections, in blog posts. That is what this has done. It's dominated the media landscape and made it incredibly difficult for like opponents of Donald Trump to actually gain any ground. Um, in the counterfactual, that just does not happen because he's not being investigated. Like, yes, we can agree that like, you know, maybe he should be charged, but we can also agree that in the instance, like in, in the times when that is unsuccessful, it is preferable in like this debate specifically that it did not happen than the fact that it happened badly. Um, so because of that, um, you know, yeah, at the, at the end of this debate, we think a couple of things. This makes hard, opposing Donald Trump incredibly hard, but is the very reason as to why it is likely that Donald Trump wins again. Um, and for those reasons, we're proud to make like, yay, I think we are. Yep, cool. Okay.
I think it is appalling that this team doesn't understand no one and has zero stakeholder analysis. Also, does not tell you anything about the current factual or why that is likely. There is no comparative work. They should look into it. Do you think that I'm going to do in my speech? Personally, counterfactual and explain what the counterfactual looks like so that it is clear for the uh, uh, panel that what the counterfactual actually is. But explain then later what does Biden look like and how does Biden actually stand in this debate. And then explaining why Trump is more likely to win if on our side as compared to the side negative um, when he runs against Biden. The first thing to note on the Cabinet Factual is that they say that there will be no media coverage for Trump because magically he will not be the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party. Magically he is not the primary candidate in the Republican Party. The amount of media coverage that he is getting might will not change. The Republican like he will still get a lot of uh, media uh, uh, media coverage. That does not mean that's just because he's not being indicted and he just gets away from the news cycle. He is still like the political nominee of a major party. But secondly, note that this might just mean that the criminal indictments in particular will not come up because they do not exist, which is to say that his maybe his criminal actions will be pointed out to, but that wouldn't be the main focus of this news coverage. But secondly, it would just, I would argue, it's just speculative as long as it's just like, oh, Trump may have done this as compared to like the criminal indictment be uh, put on the media but note that it will obviously be probably brought up by the democrats probably being like oh well he just like hit documents here or hit documents there that is probably going to happen which is to say that this team cannot run with the current faction that there is no media coverage that will support trump or like play his victim narrative card for him fox news will do that for you in both worlds unclear what the what, what they mean by that now my next question i'm going to ask is what does actually biden actually look like because this point is extremely important because this is an analysis of of vote back. This is an analysis of Biden winning or whether or not Biden can beat Trump because if Trump means wins, Biden loses. Note that our first negative speaker does tell you that uh, Trump is a bad actor and explains so much under setup of the things that he has done that you ought to care about this argument uh, a lot. It's just like important winning and like we told you that uh, by uh, Trump's bad. That's good. Anyways, um, anyways. So on vote back, is Biden currently popular? I tell you four main things. Firstly, the Biden is currently unpopular with the left wing. People are just unhappy of his handling of the israel Palestine war. Uh, and people are just, uh, people who are left wing also are just like unhappy with him. But secondly, note that he is old. That makes him just generally unpopular. But the third thing is that the polarized state of the US politics shows that people do deeply like either hate Biden a lot or like love Biden. And there's like small number of swing voters there, but there is a polarized state in the US. But fourthly, there have been failed attempts to impeach him. There have been Hunter Biden investigations, which is to say that there is that have probably contributed to his general unpopularity, which means that currently Biden is not looking good. And the thing is, you need Biden to win if you want Trump to lose. Those things go hand in hand, which means that you need a way to make Trump look worse in order to boost Biden, who is just generally unpopular for his handling of the housing crisis, for the general perception the US has about like spending money in like Israel or in sending money to Ukraine and all of the shit that he's been doing that he is unpopular. You need to make uh, you need to make Trump look far worse, look bad, look like a bad person. Because compared to these two people's vote banks, Biden will probably get those left wing voters who will probably not vote for Trump in this world and Greens like and the independents don't really stand a chance, which means that he will probably get the votes for Democrats. And the same way Trump, as we explained from first negative, will probably get votes from like MAGA, MAGA red decks and like long time Republican voters. And so given the Biden's unpopularity, this race is something that is becoming close. This, this race will have vote banks on either side that stick to their candidate, which means the delta in this debate is very marginal or it seems like it's very marginal, but it is just those passive voters. But secondly, it is those swing voters, passive voters who aren't polarized, swing voters who can go either way at this point. But thirdly, these are people from within the Republican Party, as we explained, who went away from Donald Trump when they put Nikki Haley as the primary winner for I think South Carolina or like Washington DC. One of the states she did win the primary and she also got like a lot of money from uh, like the Republican donors, which is to say this is the stakeholder you should care about, analysis that does not come from this affirmative team because everyone else will vote for they who they you probably expect them to vote for. Now, what do these voters then actually look like? I think firstly, these uh, voters, oh actually, whoa. Yeah, uh, yeah. Firstly, I think these voters are probably people who are just like generally reasonable, which is to say as long as like, if even if they are Republican, as long as Trump was not their first choice and they broke off from their party's presumptive nominee, that just shows that they have reason or that they can reason. It just shows that they're not listening to Fox News 24 seven. And they probably think critically, they have some degree of diversity of opinion away from the conventional Republican party, which means they must not let them switch back to Trump as the second option. These are people with that importance. But secondly, not 
vote, even if they do not care enough or are passive voters, we must show them how bad Trump is in order to get them to the voting box and vote for Biden and say that he's worse than Biden. But the third thing is that people who are just swing voters, we need to like sway them in the right direction. And these people are just generally people who probably get media from both sides, which is why they are swing voters. Which is to say that they have a decision calculus that is not MAGA Republican. These people are likely to switch in our world. Why are then these people likely to switch in our world? And why are these tiny majority, tiny portion of people that win determine the election go in our favor in our world? The first reason is just that the average person thinks that being crime, being charged for crime is just a bad thing. The crime is considered to be bad. If you have been taken to a court of law, it is suspicious. People usually think that. But secondly, being a president and being charged for crime, that's fucking unprecedented. There is no precedent for that. And I think that just shows how bad the president has been, how bad his actions are, that in the fucking 7,000 year history of the US, that hasn't happened before. It just shows how evil Trump is. This is enough signaling to show how bad Trump is. But the second thing is that the media will hype it up. It is a huge event and that you have headlines that say Trump going to court, Trump charged for like hush money sent to Swami Daniels. These are head catchy headlines that people can read, that people can sway people's decisions. These are something that what is important. And obviously MAGA Rednecks are going to just look at Fox News and not change their opinions. That was never the case here. But look at the counterfactual then because they do not have as much negative attention on Trump for his time. Crimes that people think are bad, or at least know that they are a bad thing. But note, secondly, they you just, I know, dem yeah, and you note, secondly, when Democrats bring it up, it's just regular mudslinging. Like, even if Democrats try to bring up old Trump, like, in selection happened, whatever, it'll just look like fucking mudslinging. It will not look like, oh, whoa, the Supreme Court, or like, some fucking court is, like, actually charging it, it's serious. It will be just dismissed as political banter, it, which means that there is no way this team can ever get the benefits of making Trump look like a bad person, something that is required because you want to show him as worse than Biden. Biden has never been indicted for a crime, so like it's automatically worse than him. Now, why are these, uh, oh actually, so what do they tell you? They tell us the first thing, they say these are minor issues that do not swing people's choice. I'd say any minor, these are firstly not minor issues, like classified documents, huge deal, but also like I'd say insurrection, huge deal. Also, I'd say that like any minor time that a president commits is a huge deal because it's the president of the country. But the second thing is that they say that he'll weaponize it to play the victim. I would argue that yes, obviously, no shit, he's going to do that. He's going to do that in either world when Democrats call him a liar and an insurrection guy. That will happen. He is the play the victim card. At least in our world, you have people who do not listen to him uh, and can make that decision calculus and probably will play into like the crybaby narrative that Donald Trump is like a crybaby. And these people can see that and change these votes. But also, I just think that his voter base, this will probably only work for his voter base who like listen to him constantly, do not have any opinion or thought. Lastly, on distrust within people, they say you mistrust the political system. I think probably not. At a point in which there is no past president of indicting a president, the fact that a president was brought into a court of law and held to account is just huge, massive, unprecedented. I would argue that this is something that people consider and people think, oh wow, our court actually worked. They brought in the fucking president and indicted him. I think that brings more trust in me instead of like being like, oh well, the president Trump didn't get uh, like in indicted. So like whatever. Also, the tries are still going one, so I'm like not sure of taking the argument whether or not he's indicted. But I would just argue that distrust in people is something that doesn't occur on, uh, on our side, but occurs on their side when Trump literally gets away without any court intervention. So proud to negate.
going to begin speaking in three, two, one. Fundamentally, what I think the, this debate boils down is three key clashes that the opposition have put forward first tonight. So first and foremost is the idea of a, a political accountability, the average, average reasonable person and their perception of what they would think, and the Biden versus Trump analysis that was previously presented by the, the speaker currently. Now, first I'm going to address all these. Um, the first one, and centrally uh, introduced by the first speaker, is about political accountability. Um, the fact that Trump is being indicted allows for transparency in the government. And you know, if a president is indicted, then it sets a precedent that any individual and any uh, American is set to the exact same golden standard. However, what I think is ironic and failed to acknowledge by the opposition is that yes, he was indicted. Yes, he was charged. Yes, these investigations did indeed happen. However, he is still running for office, and fundamentally, he is actually weaponizing this as a means to be able to further perpetuate himself along in the political system, which is, I unfortunately think will be quite repetitive in this, but I think it's absolutely central to the notion that we're being put forth here. And not only this, another argument in terms of political accountability was made that the, um, the opposition said that, oh, it'll increase voters. However, I also think that it would increase a, the amount of distrust in the US system, and subsequently, because there's more people voting, the likelihood that people, if they are going to bar cast a ballot, they're going to vote for someone who represents their experience of the injustice of the US system that Donald Trump represents for them, which is something that I will explain um, later in my, in my summaries. So, what I think fundamentally from there is the last point of political accountability they put forward is, well, this is, this has hindered Trump's election. However, as already stated, yes, he is still elected. Yes, these charges have still uh, are still in existence. However, there is still a, if not positive, a prominent view of him as an individual leader. And look, look, I'm not saying that that <coughs> any press is good press, but fundamentally, he is still very much seen in the public eye as a potential political figure and as a real. Um, as a real possibility of being the next leader of the United States, and that has not been hindered by the fact he's the chance of him being re-elected has not been hindered by the fact that these indictments have been put into place, despite the perceived perception of it. And this actually rolls into my next um, analysis of the next key argument put forward, which is all about what the average reasonable person does. And the average reasonable person, so I think it's, it was put forward by our observation, but I think we can all relatively conclude that the average reasonable person, and I think probably everyone in this room, Trump's not a great guy, we don't exactly want him as president. However, regardless of personal opinions of Trump, or regardless of the perception of Trump as a good or bad, evil or a good figure, despite the particular, in light of the particular corruption and the crimes that he's committed, fundamentally, and I think what's being fundamentally put forward about our team, it's not necessarily the perception of Trump as this evil or heroic figure. It is, sorry, whether he is or not, it is what Trump as an electoral candidate in the US represents for people. Trump speaks not to his little groupies on the side who will storm the Capitol. He doesn't just speak to his extremists. He speaks to a large proportion of the United States who feel the institutional distrust that he represents and that he, as we've argued, he represents for the people. The people feel represented. If they have an innate and an institutional distrust in their government, they are not, if they are going to vote, they're not gonna vote for someone who represents that government. They're gonna represent someone, oh yes, even though it, the perception of it is, of Trump is not necessarily a good one. They're not saying, oh, Trump's such a hero. But what they are saying and what has been weaponized is Trump as a victim of this system. Now, I think that ties in well to the, I think, final, and well, the, the next, the last major clash of this debate, which is the Trump and Biden analysis and the role that Biden plays in this perception. Now, first, the negative side has stated that Trump, um, his rise in popularity did not come from the indictments. The media coverage came out of the fact that he was indicted and investigated after the 2020 election. He was banned from Twitter and largely absent from the news and the Republican Party began to denounce him. The prosecutions against Trump into the media spotlight allowed him to gain support and thus power in the Republican Party. This was mechanized by our first and our second speaker. And I also think as an additional point out in terms of this analysis of what role does Biden play in this political race? I think what was primarily put forward is that, well, there's a decrease in popularity in Biden. And so just by virtue of him decreasing that proportionally, the amount of voters is that Trump is increasing. Well, I think fundamentally, 
there is a reason that Biden is unpopular. And I think, A, that can be by and large a comparative between what Biden represents and what Trump has represented through his weaponization of the media through his criminal investigations and indictments, as we know, I'm not gonna harp on about it any longer. But what I will say is, yet in spite of Biden's decreasing popularity, which is acknowledged and could potentially be a factor, it is really not even comparable when weighing it against the increasing popularity. Well, I think first and foremost, this looks like a few things. Trump has always been popular, he's always had a significant following, if not presence, not only, not necessarily in parliament, but in the world. So he's always had a presence, he's always been known in some capacity. So I think that's important, particularly if we're talking about a political capacity, we can definitely say 2016, he wasn't versing Biden. I appreciate that he was versing the same party with Hillary, but fundamentally comparison that Biden's going up and Trump's going down, first and foremost, Trump's always had a proportional following, However, Trump, regardless, gains some um, form of publicity from this, even if it isn't, even if it isn't beneficial. Sorry, I need to rephrase that. You know, retract it from the record. Let's uh, scratch it from the record. Okay. So fundamentally, I think what this comes down to, and I think what's been made very clear, is between these clashes that uh, political accountability, what the average of person things, and also the Trump versus Biden analysis in terms of political accountability. Um, you have this idea of, yes, transparency and, oh, the, the president can't go against the US law versus, and what I think has been well mechanized by our team, a precedent that if a president can still get charged with indictments and criminal investigations um, and still successfully be running for presidency, I'm not exactly sure that screams, you know, political accountability and the success of the justice system. Once again, coming back to the average reasonable person, uh, the recognition that despite whether we actually think Trump is a good or bad person, fundamentally, the average person is going to vote, yes, based on political beliefs, yes, based on their, uh, their political affiliation, fundamentally, the average reasonable person is going to vote to the person they correlate with the most, comparative to, I think, what the opposition has put forward is that the average reasonable person, the perception of Trump is X, and therefore people will just simply not vote for him, but I think it, it cannot be mechanized at such a simplistic level, because that's, I don't think ultimate, ultimately a fair representation of who people vote for and why people vote for certain people. Um, and then of course, the Trump versus Biden analysis, um, as I've clearly demonstrated, Trump uh, has always had increasing popularity, but it's not suffice to just say, oh, well, Biden's popularity has gone down, so therefore Trump's going up by comparison. And I think that it's been effectively argued by our first and second speaker. There's a clear distrust of the US and there is a reason that Trump is getting re-elected and will likely be the next US president. And he has successfully weaponized the, um, yeah, he successfully, it will probably become president. Okay, that's, um, that's it for me. <laughs> represents is a change from the old guard. It represents the end of people like Hillary Clinton and the end of people like Joe Biden who are perceived to be just like useless bureaucrats who sit there and do nothing and don't understand like the actual problems associated with the working class people. The problem that exists with a person like Trump is the way that he bucks the trend, the way that he gets rid of the old guard is by committing directly illegal acts. And that is not something that can be downplayed by the opposition. It's not some, something that like one A can just get up and say like, oh, they weren't that bad. Because what they fail to know is 
All four claims are directly illegal. They are direct abuses of power. They, there is a direct insurrection, no respect for democracy. And the only way that you can target the swing voters is by saying in a court of law with actually respected people, justices, saying, hey, this guy is really, really bad. He commits bad acts. No matter what you think of Biden and Clinton, this guy is always going to be worse because he doesn't represent law. He thinks he's above the law because when Trump gets up on national television and says that they can't get me, I was the president, we have massive problems with accountability mechanisms in our society. And the method that the opposition wants to suggest addresses that simply doesn't do it. And when they say that we're just like allowing Trump to like promote himself because of this and suggest that he's, you know, kind of like, oh, they're out to get me mentality, we think at their best case, that targets people who were always going to vote Trump anyway. No, not the entire population of the US stormed the Capitol. It was the very, very, very far right Republicans who were going to vote Trump no matter what, as my first negative speaker tells you. So what this debate can always be about, and all we need to do to win this debate is to prove to you that we get the attention of these swing voters. We say this guy is doing illegal acts. We, we get like negative, public, uh, ne negative publicity about Trump that has tangible impacts that will stop Trump getting re-elected, regardless of whether he's in prison or not. So, uh, three main issues in this debate. First of which, accountability. Uh, second of which, um, the effect of the counterfactual. And the third of which, all right, how does the status quo ensure, like we downplay, um, uh, uh, how does the status quo keep Trump uh, out of office too? So under this first issue of accountability, we bring you up two broad claims at Hebe. The first thing that we say um, is like when you know, like when Trump publicly claims that he's literally above the law. First of all, he doesn't understand anything about the law. That's probably bad for a president. Second of all, the, the, the far more importantly, like he actually very clearly doesn't care about any, any processes. Doesn't respect um, like the actual system. This is bad. Um, the second thing that we tell you is like the uh, politicians are should be extra accountable than the regular person. Not only just like the level of accountability of normal people, but should be held to extra level of accountability, we should get publicity on this, or like almost more so, not none, but more so because they're a president. No, know that we get no responses about this until third affirmative, but what we are told is that, the, oh, okay, so he's like still running for office and people are still voting for him, he's still ahead in the polls, like we should probably like support democracy or something. Three, uh, two main responses to this. First of which, uh, under the counterfactual, he like still runs for office. He, 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 we're, we're very unclear as to why there's a difference. We would note that our exclusive benefit is like we clear, we still have a trial going. His indictments are still occurring. Most of the benefits that we get under the status quo are yet to accrue, are yet to occur. We would just encourage you panel to like stay the course for a little bit, wait for the impacts to occur, wait for the benefits to occur. I promise they're coming because the opposition gets none of them. At best, there, there's like massive, symmetricness, whatever the word is, there's mass symmetry. There's massive symmetry in this debate because they get like no discouragement of Trump. We get probably almost definitely some in the future. On that alone, we should just win the debate. We also tell you that we have, our, so yeah, we get that exclusive benefit of accountability. And also just like some negative PR exists. Some people are going to write like, hey, he's in like, uh, he, there, he's in a court of law. There are charges made against him. Some news articles are going to write, hey, here are the list of the four things that are all very illegal, that are all very bad. You as the average voter should pay attention to this. They don't get any of that because there is no coverage, because there's no trial. So at best, Trump is still able on their side of the house to just like claim, oh, the election didn't like, we, we still won the election. Go storm the Capitol again. There is far more harms that occur on their side of the house. Um, uh, yeah, so how do we actually like, because they tell us that people are still going to vote for Trump, but what do we think actually happens? Let's flip this analysis. We think that people are going to see that he is on trial and will feel a personal democratic responsibility to keep him out because people like are going to, we think people in general are fairly respectful of the legal process. And we think that people in general are fairly understanding that when someone's on trial, something's probably up. And we think people are like the vast majority of like generally respectful, generally cognizant, generally like uh, swing voters are going to be able to see like there is a problem here. I should take my democratic responsibility and vote out Trump because there is something that like I, I like uphold the values of my country I uphold the values of the law so at the end of this issue we clearly get more accountability just because of publicity but we also think that people are going to actively take on their democratic responsibility to vote out Trump um, because you know like they respect the law far more than they respect Trump
On the second issue, the out path to victory is just that like the counterfactual give them less support. Um, they tell you that there's just like no media coverage under the counterfactual. Um, uh, we just don't think this is true um, because what, what we think is really important to note about this is we still get negative media coverage on the things he has done, regardless of whether it is a trial or not. We still think there is negative media coverage about things like storming the Capitol. We don't think that's like ever something that they can just say just doesn't occur. We also think that Trump runs in a campaign uh, between 2024, regardless of whether he's impeached uh, 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 on trial or not. But we think under their law, there is at least neutral coverage of Trump. We get at least some negative coverage of Trump. We probably at least target some more swing voters. They're at, in their best case, we still get more benefit. Third response, um, like under our under our world, we think that we, there is going to be more movement to people like Nikki Haley. As we tell you, note there's very little response to this. Note that we clearly are going to promote a better, a more moderate sector of the Republican Party, which we think just has like a lot of more, more benefits in the opposition's case. So what do we note at the end of this? We, we know that we ensure that the coverage targets his crimes, his actual things that occur, and like um, this accuses the target of this, and this actually like accesses the target audience of this debate. The second thing that we know is that the Republic Party just like goes less Trump insane, as we've seen under the status quo, as we've seen like, this is almost definitely associated with the negative PR that's gone. R moderate Republicans are moving away from Trump. There is, there is less support that is going there. This is obviously as a result of some negative publicity that occurs exclusively under the status quo. The second main claim that they tell you is that like he can just like pull this victim mentality, they're out to get me, um, as a result of this, you know, like I'm able to, you know, get re-elected. Uh, two main responses, the first of which is this is far less effective if the charges are actually established and if there's actually some legal response to this occurring. Note that once again, as I say in setup, the vast majority of this benefit is still yet to accrue. So, but we think even in this world, we think that under their model, if there is no, like, no clear public action against Trump, we think that he's able to run the like, oh, the election was rigged far more effectively because there is no court of law legitimizing what clearly is like what actually happened. Trump can just spout whatever he wants and is far more effective in doing so because there is no check and balance. This is what the legal system is supposed to do. We tell you at Hebe the separation of powers is really, really, really important and it's able to access a lot of benefits. This goes completely unresponded to. The second response that we give to you is the longer this goes on, the, the longer this goes on, the less swing voters are likely to buy it. What do I mean by this? Is I mean that like when the storming of the Capitol occurred, there was a whole lot more pro-Trump sentiment because people probably actually thought the election was rigged. The longer this goes on, the less effective this occurs, coupled with this with all of the mitigation that we get about negative PR, about negative press, about legal responses, none of which is something that the opposition can claim. What do we get at the end of the at end of this? We just like diminish Trump's Twitter, Twitter power because we have legal process. That like very clearly is gonna have more like sway on the average uh, on, on the swing voters than um, like Trump's Twitter post. The second thing that we know, that the, even if the arguments are, even if the opposition's arguments like um, are correct, we think at best they only target the absolute pro-Trumpers anyway, the people who are always gonna vote for him. We target the people that matter in this debate, so we just have to win this issue. Um, and for these reasons, I'm very proud to be here. Let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for the debate. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting debate and um, we had a very good discussion on it. Sorry, it was a little bit long. Um, that's indicative of what we thought was very close. Uh, in terms of the OA, I'm going to give some feedback, the result, and then the justification. On feedback, two things here. The first is that the entire panel agreed that this debate needed some clearer characterization about what these criminal trials looked at, looked like. This included answering questions like what is happening at the moment. Uh, I think even potentially talking about the non-criminal charges he is going on could have been a context that was mentioned. Where in the timeline are we at? Again, you know, have they been set aside, as I think is sometimes kind of suggested? Are they ongoing? Is he likely to win or not? I think all of these questions were kind of floating unanswered and genuinely made it quite hard to answer a lot of questions in this debate because we were just a little bit unsure um, what teams conceived this to look like. The second thing is, I think that this debate became really, really, really narrow in scope and that it would have been better for teams to, I guess, diversify their cases more and not just try to, you know, mitigate the debate down to, like, a very tiny group of, of, of voters and to situations that were quite similar, i.e., you know, does it matter if this is done in a court or if it's just the Democrat saying he's committed a crime? Those seem very, very similar and I don't think teams did a particularly good job at all times explaining to us why their impacts only accrued under their side or not the other side or why you know like that was kind of uniquely up uh yeah, difficult there. So I guess trying to be a bit clearer about what this looks like and trying to make sure the debate is a bit more diverse and less kind of narrow and focused. Okay, onto the result. This was a split decision and all panels agreed it was very, very close, but we did end up awarding it in a 2-1 split to side negative. So congratulations. 
Uh, in terms of explaining why that is, I'm first going to talk about electability, which was the clash that decided, you know, everyone's decision. We decided it was the most important and was also where the split occurred. And then I'll talk briefly about accountability slash like faith in the system. And then finally, uh, about precedent for like future criminality. Let's talk about electability. Here was where the split occurred. So one, the minority of the panel believed that affirmative uh, was better able to turn out voters, while as the majority believed negative was. And obviously then that increases election chances. Everyone agreed Trump winning is bad. So, you know, ergo, uh, the debate is, is kind of one here. I think that part of why a split occurred here is just because of different characterizations as to which group of voters was important. So I think that the minority of the panel agreed with affirmative that it was a, you know, group of voters who maybe are Republicans, support Trump to some extent, are, you know, disenfranchised with the institution of, you know, American democracy and who view this as a massive attack and that they're the ones who are likely to turn out who otherwise may not vote at all because of non-mandatory voting. Whereas the majority of the panel, I think, was more persuaded by side negatives analysis about the fact that we're talking about a more moderate group that is, you know, maybe not the biggest fan of Trump and this provokes them to, you know, really dislike him and to potentially turn up and vote for Biden or to not vote for Trump or to vote for kind of other Republican candidates in that instance and kind of push for change there. So that's, I think, the characterization that determined uh, the clash and where it fell. In terms of actual analysis, affirmative, I think, makes a uh, two kind of claims here. They say, firstly, people have kind of drifted away, or like Democrats have drifted away because this has been ineffective. And so they view it as the political system not working particularly well. And, you know, they're disenfranchised, such and such, all of that analysis. They say this is for two reasons. Firstly, they say it's because uh, the charges are about relatively small things. I think this is responded to by negative who say, no, they're not. Uh, and I'm quite persuaded that like storming the Capitol and keeping, you know, like confidential documents are things that are considered quite with quite a high gravity. But also the fact that they're done by a president means that people just have a higher moral standard as well. So I'm not compelled to think that these are small. Secondly, they say empirically things haven't changed, like he's still running. Again, I acknowledge that this is true and I do think that more analysis needed to be done here about whether things would change in the future. But I do think the fact that it was ongoing meant that it wasn't clear to me that voters had just kind of given up already and that they may still be invested. So I wasn't particularly persuaded by that point and I think the, uh, the, the panel agreed that the second point about feeding anti-institutionalism was the stronger way made by side affirmative. Here they give two reasons why it kind of feeds anti-institutionalism and kind of helps Trump uh, make his campaign. The first is that he just gets more discussion and coverage overall than he would otherwise. I think here affirmative gives some characterization about Trump fading away a little bit more and that this is something that has meant he's been able to be in the spotlight. Why do I think that negative is able to get over this and potentially even flip this issue? I think that's firstly because, uh, you know, they just say it is quite likely he would have gotten coverage anyway. While it is true that maybe in some capacities his... Uh, I guess domain of influence was limited, i.e. he couldn't talk on Twitter. He still was a leading Republican candidate. I think uh, affirmative themselves say Trump has been extremely popular for ages, which just suggests that, you know, he is he was president of the United States. I think the media would probably focus on him. The Democrats would be talking about him as well uh, or, or overall. And I think as well, negative suggests, although again, this is under fleshed out, that potentially the coverage in this world would be something else that wouldn't definitively be negative. They don't explicitly explain why it might be positive coverage of Trump instead, but it would be about other issues that aren't related to criminal charges, which, I don't know, roll the dice sometimes would be positive, which is probably worse overall in terms of giving him coverage at all. Or they might be, you know, focused on other elements of the electoral system, which given we agree Biden is unpopular, potentially uh, is also not a good thing to be focusing on if we want Biden to win the election. So I'm not convinced he wouldn't have gotten any coverage. I'm also not convinced that the alternative coverage wouldn't have been worse uh, overall. So I think that that, again, is not sufficient uh, for affirmative to say it strengthened him massively. The second reason they give is that it allows him to kind of boost his victim narrative and say that he's being persecuted by the institution uh, overall. Again, I think that this is well explained, but needed to be clearer put why it was the fact that this was a court case that meant that he was able to do this and why, as he has in previous election campaigns, where he has said that he is, you know, anti-institutional for a variety of other factors, or even that the Democrats are, you know, harassing him and that he is already being targeted, you know, overall in there, or all of the stuff that he, both teams agree he has already said to kind of feed this narrative, wouldn't kind of equally be effective in this instance. So again, I'm somewhat unclear why this is something that's, you know, again, going to change minds massively when all of this information is already out there and people who buy into it potentially already buy into it and people who don't. What then is negative able to bring that I think it does provide a difference and that is specific to uh, the criminal proceeding? I think this is quite simple, which is just to say that they say people think that criminality is quite bad and having Trump appear in a court of 
law and, you know, having judges involved and analysing some of the potentially negative things he's done gives it a new layer of legitimacy, which means that more people are likely to buy into it because they, you know, think that it is negative and that means they are more likely to think that he is a bad person, they're more likely to be compelled to vote against him uh, and to, to vote otherwise because they think that it would be, it would be really bad. Uh, I think that that, you know, is more clearly linked to something that just wouldn't happen at all on the alternative and that people do tend to think criminal proceedings are bad, particularly in presidents, and there are probably a group of people who are swayed on that. So I think that means that, again, while I'm not convinced it's necessarily the biggest group, uh, the majority of the panel agreed that Trump was less popular when he was being criminally uh, prosecuted. That explains that point and I think the bulk of the debate and why we awarded it. I'm going to consider the other two clashes uh, and why they weren't decisive. Firstly, on accountability or faith in the system. Here, I think negative brings a point that is somewhat principled, saying that we need the rule of law and we need separation of powers and that it would be ineffective if we didn't you know, persecute him. And maybe in the future, we might get some actual accountability. Although, as I said, I think it was somewhat unclear whether or not uh, that was going to happen at all. Uh, affirmative says, no, actually, you're going to decrease faith in the system because because people are going to see him in a court of law and go, well, if this is someone who's, you know, done criminal things and that the court's charging, why is he still running for an election? Why does he still have popularity? Here, I think potentially a uh, negative response to this, which is that it's worse if he's never in that court at all. And if people perceive him as having stormed the Capitol and, as, you know, having done the bad things that, you know, the media will publicise that he's done anyway, is probably worse. And that it's worse that there's no level of accountability, like it never even reaches that threshold of the courts. But again, I think that this point is hard to work at all in the debate because uh, the impacting on people decreasing faith in the system is both very speculative but also quite under impacted about what this actually changes in people's lives apart from voting patterns which we've already litigated so I think um for that reason it wasn't kind of uh decisive overall on the precedent for future criminality uh this is brought by both First AF and First Negative, where First AF says, uh, you know, he can kind of do worse things without condemnation because he kind of got away with it in this instance. Similarly, Neg says kind of the same thing, but kind of in the inverse. Again, I don't think that these were ever really compared against each other. I also think that they were both quite speculative. It is unclear to me that Trump committed any of his crimes based on any of this and not kind of other factors that were involved as well. Again, also, it was quite brief at both first speakers without kind of being fleshed out further and then not particularly kind of, uh, you know, impacted later on or explained what this would look like overall, as well as the fact that obviously the higher chance of a Trump presidency is what ultimately increases his ability to commit crimes in the future because he has a higher platform of power. So overall, I think that also was not uh, particularly effective on behalf of either teams. Congratulations, everyone, on the debate. I thought it was really interesting. I love US politics topics, so it was fun to watch. Uh, if you'd like individual feedback, I'd recommend getting it from absolutely anyone in the panel. And good luck tomorrow for day two.